There are paintings that carry within them an aura of mystery and whose symbolism is enigmatic, as the motives of the commissioning and the experience that determined the work are not known exactly. One such case is undoubtedly that of Jan van Eyck's portrait of the Arnolfini couple, painted in 1434 and preserved in the National Gallery in London. The earliest known description of the painting, found in the July 15, 1516 inventory of the collection of Margaret of Austria, who was in possession of it at the time, catalogues it as a large painting they call her Noel Le Finn with his wife inside a bedroom. It was not until 1857 that two art historians, Joseph Archer Crowe and Giovanni Battista Cavalcasel, based on the assonance between her Noel Le Finn and Arnolfini, identified the subject of the painting with a member of the Italian family. The Arnolfini were a wealthy merchant family from Lucca who moved to Bruges, Flanders, Belgium, where they lived from 1420 to 1472. The mystery of the work arises in the identification of the young woman standing next to the wealthy merchant Giovanni Arnolfini. Some commentators claim that she is Costanza Trenta, his first wife, others that she is actually his second wife, namely Giovanna Tsunami. Costanza Trenta, however, was already dead and buried in 1434, the year the work was made, and Giovanna Tsunami did not become Arnolfini's wife until 1447, six years after Van Eyck's death. According to some scholars, including Margaret Coster, the painting is actually a memorial work from her devoted and distraught husband to his first, unfortunate bride, a year after her death. Based on this assumption, after careful analysis of the work and the story, we came to the same conclusions, supported by the symbolism present. The painting originally had two doors that closed again, making us imagine an image intended for the private use of the husband, who opened it and contemplated it, in the moments of greatest nostalgia for his late bride. The artist probably made a quick sketch of the couple while the woman was still alive, but then, when she died, he made the final painting, but this time with precise symbolism. The artist's distinctive signature, Jan van Eyck was here, seems intended to indicate how the portrait was taken from life, the woman being still alive. The icons of Giovanni Arnolfini and Costanza Trenta, to whom he was married from 1426 until her death in 1433, appear. The work is known as one of the earliest examples of painting that has as its subject two individuals in a private portrait and not a sacred scene. The scene is set in an elegant room with a double bed and numerous objects, very expensive small treasures and is organized dichotomously, with alternating man, woman, but also, symbolically life and death. The man with his left hand holds the woman's hand, symbolizing by this act the marriage bond that unites them. In fact, it evokes the Roman ceremony, called, Dexterum Iunctio, in which the husband held his wife's hand in his hand.
This was the Kum Manu, marriage in which the woman who contracted it left her family of origin and entered a new family. The Meritus, the husband, acquired a special power over his wife, called Manus Meritalis, which took the form of caring for her and being responsible for her actions. Behind the joined hands of the protagonists, however, appears an eerie little sneering monster, symbolizing an evil looming over the wedding. The bride and groom are garnished with very expensive items, starting with glasswork windows, a commodity inaccessible to most at that time. They are wearing sumptuous, fur-lined gowns that are clearly winter, while, looking out the window, one can clearly see a flowering branch of chilies, indicative of the advanced spring season. The clothes, then, more than protecting against the cold, symbolize the extreme wealth attained by the textile merchant and are probably the icons of the finest and most beautiful fine fabrics the family traded. It should not be forgotten that Giovanni Arnolfini had business relations with Duke Philip the Good himself until, in 1461, he became his personal advisor and was allowed to associate as an equal with the court nobility. It was here that he met the artist. Her husband's robes are dark, serious, funereal even, in their severity, Unlike her robes, the outermost green, a symbol of hope but also of fertility, and the inner blue, a symbol of otherworldly life, of heaven. The type of dress makes her belly swell, and her posture, with her hand on her belly, is an auspicious ritual gesture. A promise of fertility highlighted through the particularly high belt, the fold of the fabric and the curvature of her body. The cherry tree is one of the elements that suggest the hypothesis that the painting is commemorative, the cherry fruit being a symbol of the sweetness of paradise. On the husband's side, above, a solitary candle burns on a majestic chandelier. On the wife's side there is none. The burning candle is a symbol of life, lit, present. Carved into the headboard of the bed is an icon of a woman, who has a dragon at her feet. She may be Saint Margaret, patroness of childbirth, whose attribute is the dragon. A rosary hangs at the back of the room. The glass is a symbol of purity and the rosary of devotion. The rod hanging on the right is a symbol of fecundity. Harking back to the Roman ritual of the Lupercali, during which men dressed in wolfskins, with leather whips beat women desiring pregnancy. The abandoned hooves on the floor imply that the spouses are barefoot. Such an attitude symbolizes respect for the sacredness of the floor of the house, itself a symbol of the marital union. A place as sacred as the one on which Moses rested his feet when God spoke to him from the burning bush. Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is a holy land. Exodus 3, 5. Also, the brides, red ones, stand near the bed, symbolizing home, family. The husbands are on the left, closer to the outside world.
One orange is seen resting on the windowsill and three others on a shelf below. Such fruits were a luxury in Northern Europe and are another indication of the wealth and well-being enjoyed by the bride and groom. Here they also allude to salvation from original sin following the Passion of Christ, particularly in Flemish paintings. In fact the Dutch word for orange, is Sinaz apple, the translation of which is, Chinese apple, referring to the apple in the Garden of Eden. Again a wish for eternal salvation for a soul now gone to the afterlife. The dog is a symbol of marital fidelity. The princely element of the painting is then the mirror. Ten episodes from the Passion of Christ are meticulously depicted in its frame. From the medallion at the bottom clockwise we recognize the oration in the garden, the capture of Christ, the judgment of Pilate, the flagellation of Christ, the ascent to Calvary, the crucifixion, top center, the deposition, the lamentation, the descent into limbo, and finally the resurrection. Interestingly, the scenes in which Jesus was alive on earth are on the husband's side. Those in which his passion, death and resurrection are depicted are on the bride's side. Another symbolic element that leads one to believe that the woman died in the prime of her youth, after suffering, in childbirth, in attempting to give birth to the heir she so desired. The mirror has always been a symbol of venitas, of the transience of human things. In this sense it can, in this case, be analogous to a memento mori, recalling images from the iconography of the Magdalene. My soul, you have at your disposal many goods, for many years, rest, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this very night your life will be required of you. So much wealth, so much promise. And then the baleful hand of death kidnaps the bride from a loving husband who in the immortal power of art wished to remember her, with her many virtues and with the hope of meeting her again in heaven. 